DOE, I, uh, I got so tired of hearing my checkered employment history that, uh, that I just ordered the assistant secretaries to, to say, he's old, he's had a lot of jobs, here he is. <laughs> they couldn't do it, you know, it just was impossible, but, uh, but we had a good time teasing about it anyway. So, um, so I'm glad to have a chance to talk a little bit today. I'm just going to try to step back and ask, uh, you know, where do we stand uh, in this energy transition that we really need to make in this century and be good if we did more of it in the first half of the century than, uh, than not. So, uh, so let me just charge right ahead with that. What do we want for an energy system uh, in the United States and really pretty much anywhere in the world? There are really three parts. One is, uh, is economic security. Um, Efficient uh, economies that, uh, that use uh, energy wisely and at low cost uh, uh, function well. Um, we want energy security. You want to be not too vulnerable to uh, disruptions, whether they're caused by weather or, or some bad actor in the world. Um, and obviously, we need to worry about greenhouse gases. I know you heard uh, uh, lots yesterday about climate change. Uh, it's a it's a very big, serious issue that we really have to face, and it, this week is kind of it's on everybody's minds because the, uh, the, the governor of California has convened a, uh, the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco to, uh, uh, to kind of look at what we can do. I'll, I'll say more about that in just a minute. So those are the, that's what we want. Now, how do we get there? Well, let me, um, let me say a word or two. Um, whoop. Overshot there. So this, this whole question of uh, economic security and, and how that works, um, energy costs are pretty much uh, fundamental to all the, the rest of the function of the economy. So typically, 6 to 8% of, of GDP, so that's a lot. Um, and uh, it, um, it actually has come down a little bit here. Uh, looking back, that's probably it's as much as anything oil prices, and oil prices have edged back up, so it'll be a little bit bigger fraction here. Um, but it's, it's a component that matters in how economies function because it's woven through every aspect of how modern economies work. Um, today is a good day to remind ourselves that, uh, about energy security. There's a hurricane uh, bearing down on the, the North Carolina, South Carolina coast uh, area. And, uh, and so uh, those kinds of natural disasters, whether they're earthquakes or tornadoes or, or hurricanes, can have a big impact. Um, and a, a system, an energy system that's diversified, that has lots of resources into it, uh, is more resilient in those kinds of systems. And we also have to worry these days about uh, the cybersecurity aspect of all of this as well. Um, and uh, this, whoop, I'm too fast there. Whoop. This, uh, this is uh, not behaving the way I want it to. There you go. Uh, this portion of the slide here, this is the price of oil uh, since uh, 1867, or 61 to 69, anyway. So you can see the times when there were big uh, price spikes in oil. Those were supply disruptions. And you'd like to avoid those kinds of things as well because they have big economic impacts. Um, I can remember in the days of the 1970s with gas lines and, uh, uh, and uh, no availability of fuel. So it was a big problem then, so we want to avoid that too. And then the climate and energy uh, side. I, I was a kid in Texas and grew up in Houston. This is a picture from Beijing, but this is Houston had air that looked like this uh, in those days. Some LA did as well, um, and a bunch of other cities. And, and uh, to make a very long story short, um, there was just this huge debate about uh, air quality and water quality, and some people said, well, it, you know, can't do anything about this, costs too much, uh, uh, competitors won't do it, you know, all the same words you're hearing now, by the way. Um, uh, but California was choking to death, so California said, to heck with you feds, we're going to pass some rules. They did, um, and some other states went along, and pretty soon industry was in Washington, um, uh, saying 50 sets of rules, not okay. So the Clean Air Act passed, Federal Water Pollution Control Act passed, and here we are 48 years later. Uh, we haven't solved every problem, but it's a heck of a lot better than it was. I think that's kind of where we are on the whole um, energy and climate change side of things now, that we're still in the process of making up our minds. 
Uh, there's a big debate underway, but I think it, I think the transition is underway, uh, and we should uh, do everything we can to help that. Uh, climate change is, as I said, a primary driver. I'm not going to say any more because I know you've already uh, already talked about it. So, how are we doing on uh, on greenhouse gas emissions? Um, this uh, this curve uh, demonstrates that. Uh, uh, that humans have control over this. Uh, we did manage a reduction in, um, in greenhouse gas emissions here. Unfortunately, it took a worldwide recession to do that, and that might not be the way we want to do this. Um, so instead, and, and we've, we've seen uh, uh, evidence of leveling was up again last, last year a little bit, and, and will be again a little bit this year, but, but there's already progress here that, uh, that is a, a set of steps in the right direction, and the the trick for all of us is to figure out how to not just level this off, but uh, but bring it down uh, after that as well. Um, so how how might we do that? Well, can I ask a quick question? Sure, go for it. How is, how is the uh, how is the CO two emission? How is that measured? Well, uh, with difficulty. So it uh, the way it's it, it's done. You we know how much fuel people buy. Because that's that's market transaction, so you know that reasonably well. Um, there um, and we have um, estimates of emissions from uh, uh, from other kinds of activities. Some of them are uh, a little more uncertain than others. Things like agriculture are harder to measure. Uh, but there's a whole team uh, that uh, that works on this. If you look at this uh, this website, this uh, global carbon budget website. The, the whole methodology is, is laid out. And they also have a nice set of, uh, of uh, graphs that try to partition this between the, what, what ends up in the ocean, what ends up on terrestrial systems, and what ends up in the air. Uh, uh, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a reasonable description with uh, uncertainties for all the pieces uh, uh, there as well. So it's a good question. It's not an easy thing to, to, uh, to figure out except except really for the energy industries where you have markets that determine the total amounts. So, um, so we have made progress here. We should, we should remember this even if we're, as we're being uh, uh, nervous about uh, how things might go in the future. Um, what happened was that the presidents of China and the United States stood up and in parallel, this was not an agreement, but in parallel, made uh, commitments for their countries for substantial reductions. They were different in form. They, you can see them here. They were um, uh, a statement of what those, the, those two countries were willing to undertake, at least at the time. And, um, uh, and what this did, I think, was to enable the negotiation in Paris to go forward. Uh, previous climate negotiations had sought to get a worldwide agreement. That was it turned out to be incredibly difficult. Um, but instead, the Paris Agreement was one where each country showed up with a so-called nationally determined contribution. Here's what we're willing to do. Um, and uh, and then, uh, then that came together in an agreement. It didn't, there's no, there's no enforcement there, so some people objected to that. Um, and uh, uh, but it was a worldwide uh, agreement in a sense that uh, obviously we we would need to continue to work on this over time. Uh, 195 uh, countries uh, issued these nationally determined contributions, and 20 countries um, uh, announced plans to uh, double energy and R and D over the next five years. And uh, so, and the United States was one of those uh, at the time. If you want to see more about, and then. Uh, uh, a, a coalition of investors uh, led by Bill Gates uh, agreed to put up a, um, a billion dollars for early stage investments. And if you want to see any of that stuff, you can uh, can look at those websites. Now, of course, you know that um, uh, this only gets us part of the way there. Um, if you just look at uh, at climate simulations, the uh, baseline amounts so. Uh, there's a big uncertainty here, and that uncertainty, it, as much as anything, it comes partly from the climate uh, modeling, but it also comes from the fact that it depends so much on what we do, uh, on, uh, on what emission pathways we, uh, we include. 
if you look at the uh, at what people propose to do, the nationally determined contributions you can see that, that in terms of a, a deep reduction in carbon emissions, these kind of get us halfway there. So uh, it's still more than, say, the, the two degrees C that uh, seems to have been adopted as a, as a goal, but it's not all the way to, um, uh, to getting there. Uh, so obviously we need to do more, and most of this talk is about what we might do to, to, to bring that down further. So. Um, so real progress, plenty more to do. So you say, okay, uh, how does the U.S. fit into this? Well, the United States announced that it will withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Um, you might guess that I think that's a mistake. Um, uh, but uh, lots of, I mean, this week is a good, a good time to remember uh, about all of this because uh, we have uh, lots of people convened in uh, in San Francisco to, to talk about exactly what's on the next few lines here. Lots of state governors, mayors, uh, company CEOs just said, well, tell you what, you know, we know this is coming and we're going to do it anyway. Um, and so the, the, uh, the governor's conference this week uh, is a way to, uh, uh, way to, to hammer that point home. Um, the, uh, the United States would if we just left in place the policies that we have now, we'd be, we probably wouldn't quite get to the, the commitments of the NDC, but uh, we'd be pretty close. But if we, if we change the fuel economy standards, so there's a big political fight coming on that, um, uh, then that will make it much harder. Uh, and uh, the, you know, there are a variety of policy things being considered. This is not mostly not a talk about the policy side, but... Uh, uh, but we still obviously have uh, some challenges uh, to meet there. So you say, okay, I'm convinced. What do we do? Well, um, the, the good news and the big takeaway from uh, this uh, slide, which, uh, by the way, there will be a quiz on the numbers on this slide <laughs> at, the, at, at the end. So if I, there's one message from this slide, and that is there is no shortage of energy. There's plenty of energy available. I'll, I'll, I'll explain what this means in a minute. Uh, it's all about how we convert it to energy services. So, and, and that's a place where cost matters. Uh, you know, energy is traded as a, as a commodity. Um, and if you really want to penetrate markets at scale, we have to, to make the costs be competitive. So just to illustrate the idea, so, um, so sunlight. So these, these numbers here with these arrows, these are uh, flows of uh, energy in terawatts. Uh, so for example, 162,000 terawatts of solar radiation gets to the top of the atmosphere. Some of it gets absorbed in the atmosphere, some of it evaporates water, that's a good thing because that makes rainfall and we all count on that. Uh, some of it just warms us on the surface if you follow those arrows all the way through, for example, uh, that this is what makes the wind, by the way, and we use 0.06, this is a few years old now, it's bigger than this now, 0.06 terawatts of wind energy. Um, and, um, and the thing to think about is that from the surface, we reflect about 5,000 terawatts of solar energy back to space. And uh, I think on this slide, yes, here we go. We humans use order of about 15 terawatts, that's continuous power, or in the unit that absolutely everybody thinks in, zeta joules, right? Uh, <laughs> we use about half a, a zeta joule per year. Uh, why are you laughing? I don't know. Uh, so in any case, the ovals here talk about stored resources. So we have all the, the fossil fuel resources there. We have a big nuclear resource, lots of thermal energy stored in the upper part of the Earth's crust. Um, so again, it, it makes the point, no shortage of energy. We, uh, what the whole rest of this talk will be about is, uh, is the ways that we convert those energy resources into some kind of energy services that all of us can use and, and trying to figure out how to make that part of it much cleaner. So you say, okay, uh, fine. What do we do? Well, uh, I, uh, an obvious first step, and this is actually already happening because of market forces. Right? Natural gas in this country, uh, I'll say a bit more about this in a minute, but natural gas is, is less expensive now than coal. 
the capital costs for a natural gas power plant are also quite a bit lower than they are for a coal-fired power plant. And the fuel itself has, has lower uh, carbon emissions and is much cleaner. So, so, uh, so market forces have been pushing coal out of the market to, and, uh, and natural gas uh, to cover it. Um, obviously, we want to use the low carbon technologies, wind, solar, nuclear, geothermal, hydro. Um, those all have very low gr greenhouse gas emissions. Not zero, but it's, it's much lower. Um, there's a whole big component of developing new technologies, and many of you, I suspect, here will be working on various aspects of, uh, of all of that as well. There's just a giant, wide open opportunity space here. We need to work on energy efficiency. In the United States, we have left ourselves a lot of room to do better on this. That's the politest way I can say it. <laughs> uh, Honestly, and, and to, I'll, make, I'll tell a story that makes me seem kind of dumb, which the truth was I was. So when uh, about a decade ago, when we decided that we would put in some, uh, some PV cells at our house, uh, it forced me to go look at the, um, at the utility bills. And uh, when I did, I was sort of appalled. I go, where, where the heck is all this electricity going? So, well, so I'm an engineer. So I get out my watt meter and I go measure everything in the house that I can measure. And the stuff I can't unplug, I read the nameplates. And by the end of that, I have a pretty good idea where it's all going. And it's, there's a whole bunch of simple things. I bet I didn't spend 200 bucks of capital cost doing changing lights and so on. But I did think about how we operated the machine, the house. And by the time I got done with that, I'd reduced the, uh, the electricity use by almost a third. And, and honestly, it was just paying attention. If we could all make ourselves do that, there are a lot of options. I'll talk about some big, some other options too. There are lots of things that we can do at all kinds of levels. So uh, a kilowatt hour of electricity or any other kind of energy that we don't use is one we don't have to supply. And, we, and it's, uh, uh, you know, it's just, we should be doing that at, at every opportunity. And there really are lots of opportunities here. Um, Electrifying energy services gives us some options. You still have to have clean electricity, but, uh, but then you can uh, use electricity very cleanly and it's very efficient where, when it's in the form of the electricity. Uh, there's a big thermodynamic hit frequently in getting to electricity. We're gonna need to improve our grid to, in, in com uh, to accommodate all the intermittent renewables that, uh, that we'll have. Um, and we, I think, we're going to need to deploy carbon capture and storage uh, at large scale. Uh, all, the, all the economic models suggest that it's cheaper to do the whole system if you have that available as one of the tools, but it can't be the only thing we do. So let me say a few words about kind of each of these areas. So energy efficiency. You know, the, this little graphic uh, suggests that there's just, uh, there. these are, these are complicated energy systems, but they have a lot of individual components where we can do better. I'll just give you a few examples. So here's, um, you, you might actually get a chance, you probably will get a chance to go see the, the Stan new Stanford energy system. This is really, uh, it's a clever application of a systems approach to all of this. So, and the basic idea is this, all year round at Stanford, we take heat out of buildings. The chilled water loop uh, uh, provides cooling. And all year round, we put heat back in somewhere. Uh, now, the overlap between winter and summer is different, obviously, where there's more cooling in the summer and more heating in the winter. But it, it turns out that if you just take the heat, that the thermal energy that we take out of the, the buildings and push it back into the hot water side with a heat pump, then you don't buy fuel to make all that heat and you don't buy fuel to for the for the or don't buy any more fuel for the cooling side so um this is just it's called a heat recovery system and it uses heat pumps so you still need clean electricity um but uh this uh this overlap between cooling and uh, and heating all this fuel here it saves 400 million dollars over 30 years in reduced fuel purchases it reduces our water use by almost 20% um, and, uh, and of course it's much, uh, it's much cleaner. So big, uh, big reduction in, um, in CO2 emissions for the, for the campus, a two thirds reduction. Uh, we had previously had a combined cycle, uh, natural gas 
uh, generating plant here on campus. So this replaced that. So, um, and it's fun to see and it's nice and shiny. So if you get a chance, uh, you might go see that. Big, big contribution here. Um, and a big reduction, a two-thirds reduction in the, in the campus uh, uh, CO2 emissions is really quite significant. LEDs. Um, any, anybody bought any LEDs lately? <laughs> you know, you can, yeah, lots of you, you know. Uh, when the first, uh, sometime in the early days of the Global Climate and Energy Project that Tom mentioned, um, GE gave each of us that was working on it a, a bulb, and it retailed for like 60 bu bucks. You know, you go, really? Nobody's going to pay for this, right? Well, a couple of years ago, India bought 500 million of them uh, for a buck each. Um, and uh, as the costs have, uh, have come down dramatically, this has continued the has gotten to scale. This is this is exactly what happens when you can bring a new technology to scale. But it took us an extended period to do that. So you have to have some some patience as we uh, uh, invade the marketplace. But the, the reducing the cost, you know, if you go, uh, I just was up at the cabin in the Sierras and was kind of horrified to see all the incandescent bulbs that were still there. So I marked myself off to go buy um, buy bulbs, and it's a you know, for the ones I was replacing up there, it's like an 80% reduction in electricity use for the same amount of light. So much, much more, um, much more efficient, uh, lower cost, uh, an example of what you can do at scale. And then on the, on the kind of another totally different aspect, it's, it's to think about how, both how we manufacture things and what we manufacture. So my friend, I'm a pilot, so I, I am interested in airplanes. So, so this uh, this caught my eye. So this was a this is a part that goes somewhere that it's some bracket in somewhere in the mounting in the in a commercial aircraft. If you look at how much material it takes to uh, to make that thing uh, by conventional machining, uh, it ends up with something called. Uh, that's a, around a kilogram, and it takes almost nine kilograms of stuff to to uh, make it. Um, if you uh, do this with uh, additive manufacturing, then uses uh, six tenths of a kilogram of stuff. Uh, the the finished part is just as strong, and it's uh, and it weighs uh, uh, quite a lot less. And the the conventional bracket takes three times as much um, energy to haul it around in the air just because it weighs more. So, so not only do you use the material more efficiently, you use less energy to make the part, but in its lifetime, uh, it also uh, uses lots uh, less energy. So, so now, if you think about the opportunity space for figuring out how to do this in all kinds of applications, there are lots, so and you'll see much more, I think, on this. So it's another application of the whole energy efficiency idea. You say, okay, fine, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced on that. Now, uh, what else do we need? Well, obviously, we need clean electric power. Um, and there's good news on this front as well. This is, if you just look at, at power capacity additions around the world. Now, I need to say... A word here about capacity factors. People use the term capacity factor to um, to indicate what fraction of the of the uh, you know if you talk about a capacity of a solar cell, it it's that they talk about that as when the sun's directly overhead, it's peak power. Uh, but you don't have peak power all day long uh, uh, unless you have an exquisite tracking system. So um, so. Uh, the the average for a lot of solar cells about twenty percent of the of the the peak capacity is the wind turbines thirty to forty percent um, natural gas turbines it depends on which kind it is but uh, uh, could be in the fifties nuclear power plants typically close to ninety percent so so capacity factors differ so you have to be a little careful in, in uh, uh, looking at all this but you can see coal is being retired some gas retirements but a whole lot of uh, of renewables, solar, wind uh, uh, are the big ones uh, here. So, um, so there's a there's a big effort here, and part of this is really due to the fact that we can reduce um, uh, costs. Uh, when I was at DOE, we worked on uh, there was a, a program called Sunshot, which had a whole series of goals uh, for 2020, which we we could see we were going to meet early. 
And so we decided we needed to go think about where, whether we could make this better. And sure enough, uh, we, we had to work hard to convince the Secretary of Energy that, uh, that this was not a fantasy and that we were not assuming six miracles along the way. Um, and there are lots of components of the cost, but we could see pathways for the 2030 goals to get this down to, to half that, in some cases, lower. Uh, so there is a, a, an opportunity for continued, uh, uh, continued reductions in costs uh, there, too. And I will say that if, if we can get the cost of solar and wind down into the two cents a kilowatt hour range, then we can think about another trans uh, transformation. So you can think about solar fuels, you can think about a whole variety of, uh, of storage options that, uh, that create more, more uh, possibilities for the future. So, so lots going on here, deep reductions in solar and wind uh, in, the, in the last uh, 10 years. And, uh, and so those are now getting to scale uh, in this country. You say, okay, you know, this thing is touchy. Um, so what about nuclear power? Um, right now, uh, nuclear power is just under 20% of, uh, of the U.S. electric power, and it's a big fraction of the non-greenhouse gas power. Um, those plants are actually having um, a tough time uh, competing now, so, um, so there is a, uh, uh, there's reason to worry about having to replace this as well. There are some things on the on the agenda here that uh, that allow um, uh, uh, new reactors, the small modular reactors, uh, and various other op options. Uh, the big issue here, the two big issues. One is cost. The nuclear power plants are having trouble competing on cost, and uh, and that's still likely to be true in the future. And the other is waste storage uh, that we still have not settled that in this country. So what about natural gas? Well, natural gas uh, has, there's been a revolution in this. Uh, the ability to drill long reach horizontal wells and make them go you where you want to go. Um, it's, it's sort of magic that they can do this. Imagine taking a piece of flexible drill pipe, so a piece of spaghetti and trying to push it through the jello from, from the top. You know, it's, it's hard to do, right? Well, what, what works is that you have to get use the drill bit to pull it through. Uh, but in any case, they can do this now, and then learning how to, to hydraulically fracture it so that you can uh, can create flow paths into the wells uh, opened up um, a uh, the natural gas that's stored in uh, rocks called shales. If you do this, um, uh, replace natural gas with a, an old coal-fired plant with natural gas. Uh, there's about uh, almost 60% less carbon in the fuel, and the efficiencies go up uh, dramatically. So if you do it uh, with a combined cycle plant, it's an almost 70% reduction in uh, CO2 per kilowatt hour. Even with a single cycle gas turbine, uh, it's about almost a 50% reduction. So, so these, um, these uh, give you big um, options. Um, and uh, if you look at the, the, uh, uh, the future, uh, there are some possibilities out there as one. Here's one. Um, it turns out that you can, if you're willing to separate pure oxygen from air, you can burn natural gas in a uh, uh, combustor here that uses a CO2 turbine. It's a, it's a supercritical turbine, and because mass flow over the wing is what determines how a, uh, uh, a turbine works, uh, and CO2 is denser than steam, you can have a small turbine um, and then you just cool it to knock the water out and now recompress and recycle. So you have a CO2 cycle here. You have to take some CO2 out in order not to have the thing just keep uh, expanding forever. Uh, but then that's already at high pressure. It could be used for carbon capture and storage. And the projections are competitive cost of electricity. Now we'll see whether they deliver that. Um, uh, I'm not going to have time to talk about all of these, but uh, there's been um, there's been some uh, quite a lot of work here at Stanford uh, on carbon capture and storage, and uh, if you look at these slides later, you can get the names of the faculty members that have been working on all of this. Uh, there really is a lot uh, lot that's been done, and we know a lot about it, um, uh, and are thinking about the next set of systems uh, in storage and shales as well. There's also lots and lots of new technology R and D, and I'm sure you're you're hearing from some of these folks along the way. 
uh, I'll just talk about one because it's kind of a fun thing. So this this is a device. It's a this is this was actually predicted theoretically before the first systems were were built. But the idea is a uh, a device that uh, that is emits uh, radiation in a frequency range that for which the the atmosphere is transparent even during the daytime. So now you you have three degrees Kelvin out of out in space. You have the surface temperature. Um, and the radiation heat transfer goes as the temperature difference to the fourth power. So, so this is um, uh, this 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 rejects heat to the, to space uh, even in the middle of the daytime. You get modest cooling in the daytime, but at night you can really drive temperatures down quite low. You still have to have some energy to to do a heat transfer fluid to put this into or out of a building. By the way, but. But uh, it doesn't take any vapor compression or liquefaction in order to do the cooling part of it. So pretty cool. So what about transportation? Well, uh, batteries and, uh, and hybrids, you're starting to see uh, these um, uh, EVs uh, making their way into the marketplace now. Uh, lots of auto manufacturers have new vehicles coming up. Uh, and, um, uh, and so you'll see much more. Britain and France have announced plans to prohibit IC engines. Uh, after 2040, so we'll see if that holds. Right now, it's only kind of one percent of vehicle sales, but uh, uh, so obviously we have a long way to go. And even even if you just look at rates of penetration estimated, obviously uh, it's about a third of vehicles by 2040, according to one set of estimates. Uh, but we have a long way to go, which just says to me that we need high efficiency engines and uh, and uh, uh, need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from uh, oil. Uh, that we burn and recover, and I just see Adam Brandt just walked into the office, and he's—I mean, into the room—and he's going. I bet he's going to say something about that. Are you? Are you, Adam? Good. So, so you'd think we coordinated this. Um, so there's been lots of work here uh, at uh, at Stanford as well about uh, combustion, maybe wireless transfer of power to vehicles, uh, better uh, better batteries for these, and light weighting for the vehicles as well. Lots of lots of research, and of course, the 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 dream. I think uh, this is you'll if, if I get there, you'll see my wish list, which includes um, uh, the ability to take electricity, all that solar and wind uh, during the daytime, for example, and turn it into a fuel that we could use then uh, for uh, transportation system chemical storage uh, there. Would be needed. now to do this. You'd have to. You have to have the electricity. You have to have the right kinds of catalysts. You need to be able to reduce CO two, uh, and you need to store all the kinds of things. So there are big, big uh, uh, things that would have to be done. But drop-in fuels would make this all much easier. Um, and uh, and then of course we would also like to have some uh, some machines that use solar energy and. Uh, and use that to make long chain molecules. Um, and it would be good if they would self assemble these machines. Uh, we, you say, wait, we have those. They're called plants. That's what they do is they take solar energy and they make big long chain molecules. So, so the idea of using um, uh, renewable fuels uh, and biofuels is a possibility as well. And then there's all this solar and, uh, and so on. So, okay, the grid. I'm not going to spend uh, too much time on this, except that to say that we need a big, we need a grid that's better than uh, what we have now. The old one is a medium-sized number of big power plants, radial distribution. What we're coming to is a world where there's lots of distributed generation. It's much more interconnected. They're microgrids, um, and we're beginning to see how to do that. But there's lots of interesting mathematics in how you mod model these systems. And lots of evidence, uh, I'm just going to skip on past uh, that, but lots of evidence that these can do better. Um, and these are systems of systems, so we need to do much better on understanding how to, to operate and manage and optimize these very complex systems. Lots to be done there. Plenty of work to be done on energy storage uh, as well, and I'm sure you'll hear about that. So um, a topic, uh, you know, the, the California governor just, the governor just signed a bill that says we want 100% clean electricity by 2045. So this is the, the main issue we're going to have to deal with there. In the daytime, even now, 
you see as the, the uh, solar uh, energy is available during the middle of the day, um, as the sun goes down in the in the evening, you, right now you have a big ramp rate that uh, the, where you have to replace all that solar power. That's done with natural gas now, um, and so we'll have to either with some combination of storage or uh, or, or perhaps uh, carbon capture and storage, we would need to uh, um, to accommodate all that. Better grid connectivity would help too. Lots lots to do there. So um, so the I'm, I'm going to have to stop here, uh, but here's, here's my wish, and, um, and honestly, folks, the reason you're here is to do this, um, plus, plus the stuff that I forgot, and if you gave me more time, I'd, I'd talk about some more, but I'd like electrochemical CO2 reduction. I think that would help a lot. It would let us uh, uh, close the fuel loop. Biofuels that store carbon and cost matters here. More efficient water purification, you know? Uh, water is going to be a big issue for us uh, going forward in this century as well. The dry places are going to get drier and the wet places are going to get too wet. So we're, we're going to have issues there. Uh, batteries, earth abundant materials, non-toxic and low cost and durable. Those would uh, help many options there. Better sensitive for sensors for methane. You know, methane is a big powerful greenhouse gas and uh, maybe Adam's going to say a word about that too. But uh, uh, to the extent that we can can uh, control fugitive methane, it buys us time on all the other stuff. Power electronics for uh, transformers and, uh, and all kinds of other applications. The solid state ones are, are better than the, than the transformers we have now. We need to do active controls on electric power and uh, manage the grid better. Low cost, low global warming potential air conditioning. Solar at uh, two cents a kilowatt hour, and oh, by the way, could we have a price on carbon? That would help. Okay, so I'm going to quit. Um, I've really said all of these things. Though. I'll just make this one point. Really, this is a portfolio. We have to work, particularly on the R&D side, we need to work across primary energy resources and the ways we transform those into energy services. We need uh, work on all those fronts simultaneously, especially, especially those of us in the R&D side, because some of these are going to make their way into the marketplace and others might not. Um, and so, uh, so we need a very, um, uh, very well-stocked portfolio. And um, uh, most of those topics that uh, I talked about there are being looked at somewhere in this university. And I'll just close by saying we can do this. Uh, I'm quite confident we humans are very inventive when we make up our minds to do something. We're still in the process of making our, up our minds, but I believe we can do this. Uh, and uh, with all of your help, we can make it happen. Thank you very much. I'm curious, is there one technology or company that you explored recently that you're really excited about? Well, you know, the, I showed that slide of the net power uh, CO2 uh, turbine. That, the, the, the thing that I find interesting about that is that it, it, there's, a, there's a demo plant just being built or has been built outside of Houston. They're in testing now. Now, we'll see if they deliver. But if they do, then it kind of changes the game in terms of the, of the capture side. And it gives us an option to, uh, to do the intermittency balancing part of this in a way that it was uh, might be a little easier to do in a very clean way. So, so that's cool. And then if you just look across the battery landscapes, uh, uh, that's just, uh, there's so much cool stuff that's going on there. It's, uh, you know, there's just, there's endless opportunity here. Yeah. It's just, you're at a, you're working at a great time in the whole, uh, uh, the whole energy side of things here. So we set targets for different countries uh, in order to introduce the two degree goals. Do you, um, what do you think is the most, the fairest way to different shapes between? Yeah, so this, this is a really hard question. The question is, um, for different countries, how do you do this fairly? Um, and uh, there's, uh, it's almost certain to be uh, a continuing debate, but the way I think the way forward is to, to kind of do what, what has been done in the Paris Agreement, which is to have each country figure out what makes sense for them. Um, you know, we all benefit from, uh, from lower greenhouse gas emissions, but most of the time, take China for example, um, 
China has big air quality issues in, in some of its cities. Working on these things can get at both goals simultaneously. So there, there are differing kinds of motivations that uh, will drive each country and, and quite different settings. In, I mean, there's plenty of sunlight in Saudi Arabia, um, uh, not so much in Norway. Uh, so, so, uh, so it will be need to be done on a regional basis. So I think it's really, we need to depend on countries to, to uh, use their own resources to figure out what makes sense for them rather than trying to impose it uh, from the outside. Has anyone worked on anything that can exploit ocean thermal gradients? Uh, ocean thermal gradients, yes. Uh, there's a, the OTEC, uh, Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion is, is the idea. Um, and the basic idea there is if you have, if you have a, the, as you go down in the water column, it gets colder. Um, typically, the bottom of the ocean is like one or two degrees C um, once you get away from the continental shelf. Um, so you can exploit that temperature difference to, do, uh, uh, to run a turbine. They tend to, the temperature differences are not that big. Um, and it's, so it takes, so the efficiencies are pretty low and it takes big systems. So in the right place, maybe I would say it'll be a modest contribution overall. Um, what kind of innovations or work has been done to, for the security side of energy production? You mentioned that at the beginning of your talk. I'm yeah. Curious of how far that along that's gone. Yeah, so on the security side, well, well, diversification is one big element of that. So if you're, if you're totally uh, dependent uh, on an imported resource, for example, that makes you more subject. So, so uh, domestic production of various kinds of, uh, of energy is one way to get at that. Um, the whole cybersecurity side, I think, is very important in terms of national security because the, um, it's now, um, you know, if some Russian hacker uh, interrupts my refrigerator at home because it's connected to the internet, world's not going to end. But if, if they do that to the grid, that's, you know, that's obviously I don't, I'm teasing about that, you know, I don't, don't uh, but, uh, but, but this just thinking about, about resilient complex systems, I think there's much more we can do. If you think about the, the world we live in, there's the grid, that's one system, there's the pipeline network, there's the transportation network, there's water delivery, there's sewage treatment. These are complicated systems, and they're all linked to each other. You can't operate any of them without the others, but we always think about them as, if we think about them as systems at all, as the individual pieces. But we need to do a much better job of that. So there's a really interesting set of resilience questions associated with that, too. So lots to be done in that area. Oh, wow. Uh, maybe just one last quick question for Luke. Okay, yeah, this is great. Uh, are global warming and climate change the same thing? The global warming and climate change is the same thing. I think most of us who work on this uh, use those terms uh, sort of in uh, partly interchangeably. It's, it's not only the temperature that matters. Uh, for example, for those of us who live in California, uh, uh, warming is part of that, but the distribution of rainfall and snowfall also matters because we depend on it for water. Um, it's related to climate change, uh, but it's not exactly uh, identi uh, identical. So warming matters, but so does the fact that we're putting lots of CO2 in the ocean, which changes the pH of the ocean, and that uh, that makes it harder for the critters that uh, fix cal calcium carbonate. So these are big complex systems, and I, we need to think about the whole whole panoply of effects. Okay, let's thank uh, Lynn again for a great talk.